six foot seven, 250 pounds, and built. And he did what you'd expect someone like that to do, whether it was corralling rebounds or bullying a defender down low. But it didn't stop there, as even at his size, he could handle the ball as well as some guards and had great court vision. So whether he was pushing the ball in transition or operating from the post, he was a threat to score or find the open man. But where he made his money was on the defensive end. His deceptive quickness and agility gave him the ability to defend smaller guards, while his size and strength made him a brick wall down low. And he showcased these abilities for over a decade as one of the league's top defensive players, who consistently drew the opposing team's best player. He never had gaudy steal or block numbers, as his impact came by how difficult he made life for his opponent. And he also spent his best years as one of many elite defenders on great New York Knicks teams. And the bigger names on those teams tend to get the recognition more often. But having an all-world defender coming off your bench is a luxury all teams wish they had. And that's why today's episode will be taking a deeper look at the career of the late, great Anthony Mason. Let's draw your memory. Anthony Mason attended Springfield Gardens High School, where as a junior in 1983, he helped lead the team to a public league championship and an appearance in the state championship. During his run, Mason would be the team's sixth man, as senior Shannon Greer was given the start due to seniority. Mason wanted to be the starter, but was willing to accept the role in the name of team success, which saw Springfield Gardens defeat some great teams during their run. So I couldn't find any footage of Mason in college, and I don't want you guys to have to stare at the same two pictures and listen to me talk for five minutes. So we're gonna do a quicker summary of his time at Tennessee State. Mason spent four years with the Tigers, where as a freshman he would be one of four players to average double figures and would be second in rebounding, as the team went 9-19. and 19. As a sophomore, he upped his scoring nearly 8 points and led the team in scoring and rebounds, while helping them to an improved 14-14 and 14 record. His junior season brought further improvement as he again led the team in scoring and rebounding, while tying for the team lead in steals, and his 9.7 rebounds per game was good for second in the conference as he helped the team to a 15-12 record in their first year in the Ohio Valley Conference. Mason's senior season was his best, as he put up 28 points and over 10 rebounds per game, and he led the conference in scoring, rebounding, and made free throws, en route to a first-team all-conference selection. However, the Tigers dropped to an 11-17 record in Mason's final season. The 88 NBA draft had been shortened from 7 rounds to 3 rounds, but Anthony Mason would still be waiting a while to hear his name as he was selected in the third round, 53rd overall, by the Portland Trailblazers. But he would be cut days later, and after not being picked up by anyone else, he would go play in Turkey for Efes Pilsen during the 1989 season. He would return to the NBA for the 1990 season, and was signed by the New Jersey Nets. But this would be a forgettable year for New Jersey, as they were coming off a 26-56 season, had a new coach in Bill Fitch, and had also traded one of their best players in Buck Williams to Portland for Sam Bowie and a pick. Additionally, another one of their best players, Roy Hinson, would deal with knee problems, which eventually led to his retirement the following year. Mason would be an afterthought on the Nets, as he would appear in just 21 games while only getting about 5 minutes per game, as New Jersey finished with the league's worst record at 17-65. and And Mason's rookie season saw him average about 2 points and 1.5 and rebounds per game. The Nets chose not to re-sign Mason, and he hadn't really gotten a chance to prove himself worthy of a roster spot with another team. So going into the 91 season, he would sign with the Tulsa Fast Breakers of the Continental Basketball Association, where in 26 games, he would average nearly 30 points and 15 rebounds per game. But then on December 28th, he would sign with the Denver Nuggets. He would appear in three games in Paul Westhead's run and gun offense, but after 20 days, he was released on January 17th. And for his very brief 91 season in the NBA, he would average about 3.5 points, 1.5 rebounds, and half a steal per game. But Mason wouldn't be done playing professional basketball in 91, as he would briefly play with Marinos de Oriente in Venezuela, and would finish the year with the Long Island Surf of the USBL, where he would average about 28 points and 12 rebounds, and set the single game league record with 28 rebounds, as he was named all USBL first team. During the summer, Mason would sign on to the New York Knicks Summer League team, and would play well enough to earn a spot on the team going into 92. But he did more than just earn a spot, he found a home. He would play in all 82 games this season, earning the most minutes per game of any non-starter. And he wouldn't get eased into the role, as new head coach Pat Riley would play him 31 minutes in the season opener, and overall he would finish the year as the team's third best rebounder. 
as he would have 18 games with double-figure rebounds and seven double-doubles. But it was his defense and toughness that he would become renowned for, as in his first full season while playing a minimum of 2,000 minutes, he finished with a top 20 defensive rating in the league, and was one of four Knicks to finish in the top 25, as the Knicks had the second best scoring defense and second highest defensive rating in the league, en route to a 51-31 record. Outside of Mason, the Knicks featured superstar center Patrick Ewing and fellow enforcers Charles Oakley and Xavier McDaniel, while the backcourt featured Gerald Wilkins and Mark Jackson, and along with Mason coming off the bench, the Knicks would also have the scrappy John Starks. They would enter the playoffs with the matchup versus Detroit, and they would embarrass Detroit with a 34-point Game 1 win. But after this, the series would be a war, as each team traded wins until the Knicks closed out the series in Game 5. Mason again wouldn't have much of an offensive role, however he did put up 11 points on 5 of 18 shooting in a Game 3 win, and would pull down 11 rebounds in the Game 5 win, as the Knicks moved through to play the defending champion Chicago Bulls in Round 2. The first 5 games of this series would be another battle, as each game was decided by 8 points or less. Mason didn't have a big offensive role, but would pull down over 6 rebounds per game, and the Knicks would go into Game 6 down 3-2, but they won by 14 to push the series to 7. Unfortunately, they would collapse in Game 7 and lose by 29 points. And for his first season in New York, Mason would average about 7 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. Mason had done enough to get a 3-year contract with New York, as at the age of 26, he finally had some career stability. The 93 Knicks were one of the greatest defensive teams of all time, and that was in big part due to having a defensive anchor like Mason coming off the bench to lead the second unit. During the offseason, the Knicks had done more to bolster their defense, as they were involved in a three-team trade that saw them ship out Mark Jackson, but receive point guard Doc Rivers and forward Charles Smith from the Clippers. And they had also traded a first-round pick to Dallas for shooting guard Rolando Blackman on draft day. Starks and Blackman split time starting, but the one constant off the bench was Mason, as he played 81 games, coming off the bench in every one of them, and was one of three players on the team to average over 30 minutes per game. He would improve his scoring to become one of four players to average double figures, and would do so while shooting over 50% for the second straight year, as he would record 13 double-doubles, including a 30-point, 16-rebound win versus the Lakers on March 26th. But he took an even bigger step on the defensive end, as he finished with the 8th best defensive rating in the league, as 5 Knicks finished in the top 25, and the Knicks overall featured the league's top scoring defense and top defensive rating, as their 60-22 record was the best in the East. New York would get the Pacers in round 1 of the playoffs, who they would defeat in 4 games, as Mason had an incredible series. He would improve his output every game, as he put up at least 13 points and 7 rebounds in games 2-4, through four, including 25-10 with 3 steals on 11-13 of 13 shooting in game 4. The second round brought a young Charlotte Hornets team, and although New York won in 5 games, it was a very close series, with games 2-5 through five being decided by 4 points or less. Mason would put up about 10 points and 8 rebounds, along with nearly a steal and block per game, and would even finish 3rd on the team in assists, at over 3.5 per game. The conference finals brought a rematch with the Bulls, and the Knicks took care of business in the first 2 games to go up 2-0, but would then lose 4 straight to lose the series. Although they were all losing efforts, Mason would play great in games 3-6. through six putting up at least 12 points every game and never shooting below 50%, as he would shoot at least 50% in every game this series, with three games shooting at least 60%. The series would also include the famous late game sequence in Game 5, where with the Knicks down one, Charles Smith was blocked on four straight attempts under the hoop, which would have given New York the lead. But for the regular season, Mason averaged about 10.5 points, eight rebounds, and two assists per game. With Michael Jordan's retirement, the Knicks automatically became the favorite to make it out of the East. They would however deal with some serious injuries this year. They got off to a 15-4 start, but during a December 17th win versus the Lakers, Rivers would suffer a season-ending knee injury. The Knicks would go 5-3 after the Rivers injury, but didn't want to miss their championship window, so they traded for longtime Mavs point guard Derek Harper on January 7th. Additionally, during the offseason, Charles Smith had knee surgery, but would deal with flare-ups this year, as he would only appear in 43 games, which led to Mason starting 12 out of the 73 games he played this year, as he started his first career game on November 9th, 1993. Overall this season, he recorded 6 double-doubles and had 25 games in double figures. He did see a 3-point drop in his scoring, but he was playing less minutes and taking less shots than 93. He had a defensive rating of 100.7, which would have put him at 14th in the league. However, he failed to play at least 2,000 minutes this year. 
but along with him, the Knicks still featured four players in the top 15 for defensive rating. But the Knicks really couldn't escape injuries. As Starks had surgery to repair cartilage on March 15th and would miss the rest of the season as the Knicks finished 57-25 and, and entered the playoffs as the two seed, but they would have Starks back for their first round matchup versus New Jersey. However, the Knicks had also ended the season without Mason, as Pat Riley had suspended him for the final three games for conduct detrimental to the team. Riley had benched Mason for the entire second half in a game against Atlanta, who they were fighting for top spot in the conference. And this led to Mason making some comments, suggesting that he was the team's top offensive option at small forward over Charles Smith, and he would also question Riley's definition of offense. And all these things led to Riley making the suspension. However, according to Smith, Mason did call him after he made the comments to clear the air between the two. Nonetheless, the Knicks defeated New Jersey in four games, with the Nets' lone win coming by a single point in Game 3. Mason, however, was a non-factor in this series. He received about six less minutes per game, while putting up less than two points per game, on just 25% shooting. Round 2 brought another series with the Bulls, however the Knicks didn't have to worry about Jordan this year. But even without Jordan, the Bulls gave New York all they could handle, as the series went the full seven games. Mason was given a much larger role, and responded as the team's bench leader in scoring, rebounding, and assists, while shooting over 57% from the field, which included a 15-point, 14-rebound double-double in a Game 2 win. And he also helped hold Scottie Pippen to 40.5% shooting for the series. The conference finals brought an Indiana Pacers team on an unexpected playoff run, but the Knicks looked prepared, with double-digit victories in games 1 and 2. But then the Pacers would stun the Knicks by winning 3 straight, Luckily, the Knicks used their experience to take Game 6 in Indiana before outlasting the Pacers to win Game 7 by 4 points. Mason again provided a great bench option for the Knicks, as he outplayed starter Charles Smith and put up about 8 points and 7 rebounds per game, as the Knicks were making their first trip to the NBA Finals in over 20 years. The Finals brought a marquee matchup at the center position, as the Patrick Ewing-led Knicks were taking on the Hakeem Olajuwon-led Rockets. From an offensive perspective, Mason was solid, but nothing special, putting up about 8.5 points and 7 rebounds on about 47% shooting. But he was able to put his elite defense on display versus league MVP Elijah As while the Knicks sent a committee of defenders throughout the series, Mason was arguably the most successful. As after Elijah had failed to shoot above 48% just 5 times across the first 3 rounds, he would have 4 games in the finals where he failed to crack 48% which included Mason being primarily responsible for Elijah Wan scoring just 4 points in the 4th quarter of a Game 2 win. And his great defense allowed Ewing to roam the paint and average nearly 4.5 blocks per game for the series. But the bigger story of these finals was the play of John Starks, who was playing with a heavy heart as his uncle had passed shortly before the finals. But he would struggle throughout the series along with Ewing as both players shot below 37%. However, with the Knicks up 3-2, Starks would have 27 points in Game 6, but would have a potential game, series, and title winning shot grazed by Elijah Wan, which kept Houston alive. So the series would go 7 games, and even in Game 7, Mason would contribute to Elijah Wan struggling from the field, as he went just 10 of 25. But the Knicks would lose, as Starks went 2 of 18 from the field, and New York lost by 6. And for the regular season, Mason averaged about 7 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The 95 Knicks looked the same, however Oakley would miss 32 games with a dislocated toe. They got off to a slow start at 12 and 12, but would go on an 8 game win streak and overall would go 55 and 27. Mason would have a great year off the bench, as he put up nearly 10 points and 8.5 and rebounds and did so on a career high 56.6% shooting, which was good for 3rd in the league. He was every bit as good on the defensive end as well, as he finished 8th in defensive rating as one of 2 Knicks to finish in the top 10. He would have 39 games in double figures, and 28 games with at least 10 rebounds. But for the second straight season, he would be suspended late in the year, again for conduct detrimental to the team. Mason and Riley got into an argument on the bench, apparently over the way Mason was responding to Riley's direction to double team the ball, which led to Riley sending him to the locker room, and Mason eventually saying that he wants out of New York. And this 5 game suspension would be the only games Mason missed this year. But aside from this blemish, it was a dream year for Mason, as he would finally be recognized for his bench play and was voted the 1995 Sixth Man of the Year. The Knicks would take on the Cavs in Round 1 in a four-game series that was surprisingly close, with three games being decided by seven points or less. But the Knicks' experience again was the difference maker in pushing them through to the second round. Mason continued his usual efficient play off the bench with about 8.5 points and 6.5 rebounds on over 62% from the field 
The second round brought a rematch with Indiana in a series filled with memorable moments, such as Reggie Miller going for 8 points in 9 seconds to give the Pacers a 2 point game 1 win, where Miller's second 3 came off an errant inbounds pass from Mason after Greg Anthony fell down while Mason was making the pass. The Knicks would win game 2, but Indiana went up 3-1 after 2 home wins. New York would push the series to 7 games, which included Patrick Ewing hitting a game winner in game 5 to keep the Knicks alive, but game 7 would end in heartbreak as Patrick Ewing would miss a game tying layup in the final seconds. And Mason would again put in an efficient series with about 10 points and 6 boards on 60% shooting, and his regular season saw him average about 10 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Although Mason had said he wanted out and was a free agent going into the offseason, he would re-sign with New York for 5 years, $24 million, after he had turned down a 3-year, $9 million extension the year prior. And this makes a lot more sense when you factor in that Riley had left to become coach of the Miami Heat, and new head coach Don Nelson said that Mason would be a much bigger part of the offense in 96. And he was. As for the first time in his career, Anthony Mason was a starter, and he would play and start in all 82 games while leading the league with 42.2 minutes per game. The Knicks were an aging team as Mason, who was 29, was the youngest member of the starting five, but his first season as a starter would see him finish second on the team in scoring and rebounding, while finishing first in assists and doing so on over 56% shooting, as his versatility was finally on full display. And although his first season as a starter saw him put up the worst defensive rating of his time in New York, he was still elite as he finished top 25 in the league for the fifth consecutive year. Nelson coached the team to a 34 and 25 record, but his up-tempo style of play was a stark contrast to the Knicks' usual slow-paced, defensive-oriented basketball. And Nelson's preference was running the offense through Mason as a point forward, with Ewing receiving less touches, which Ewing reportedly didn't like. And this, along with other players' unhappiness, led to Nelson's firing. But the breaking point, as was confirmed by Nelson, was that he made a suggestion during the season for the Knicks to offer a package headlined by Ewing to the Orlando Magic for center Shaquille O'Neal who was rumored to be interested in New York, and that this news had gotten back to Ewing, which tarnished he and Nelson's relationship. Nelson was replaced by Jeff Van Gundy, and the Knicks went 13 and 10 the rest of the way, to finish 47 and 35. Round one would bring another matchup with the Cavs, which the Knicks won in three, as Mason put up about 15 points, nine rebounds, and five assists per game, including a game high 23 in game two. The second round brought the 72 and 10 Bulls, who now featured Michael Jordan. Mason continued playing well with about 11.5 points and 7 rebounds on over 56% shooting, but Stark struggled and Jordan's 36 points per game were too much as Chicago won in 5. However, Mason would again play good defense, particularly on Scottie Pippen, who shot 33% for the series. And Mason's regular season ended with him averaging about 14.5 points, 9.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. But this would also unexpectedly be the final time that Mason put on a Knicks uniform. After the season, Mason was sent to Charlotte for Larry Johnson, and he wasn't happy about being traded a year after signing an extension, and he would even accuse Patrick Ewing of playing a part in him being traded, as there may have been some bad blood due to Mason's larger role in the offense during the season. But Mason had also been in trouble a few times over the past year, as he had been sued for beating up three people during the 96 offseason, and again had recently been sued for a nightclub incident which happened in January. And then after the trade, he was arrested for getting into a fight with wait for it, 10 police officers on July 25th. But the trade was done, and Mason was a Hornet heading into 1997. Mason joined a Hornets team led by Glenn Rice, who they had acquired through a trade prior to the 96 season, and they had also made a draft day trade to bring in center Vlade Divac. With so many changes, the Hornets weren't expected to be good this year, but they proved doubters wrong by finishing with the franchise record 54 wins, and this was in large part due to Mason. This would be a year of career highs for Mason, as he led the league on a career-high 43.1 minutes per game, while averaging a career-high in scoring, rebounding, and assists, as he led the team in rebounds and assists, while finishing second in scoring, on over 52% from the field. He would put up 44 double-doubles and 4 triple-doubles, while recording a career-high 12 assists in two separate games, and a career-high 22 rebounds in a February 25th loss to Dallas. He would fall out of the top 25 defensive rating for the first time in 6 years, but was still an effective defensive player, averaging a steal per game, as he would be voted 3rd team All-NBA and 2nd team All-Defense. The Hornets would play Mason's former team in Round 1, but the Knicks' experience led to a 3-game sweep. 
Mason would still average a double-double at 13 points and 12 rebounds, but he would struggle from the field, shooting about 42%. But for the regular season, Mason would average a career-high 16.2 points, 11.4 rebounds, which was good for third in the league, and 5.7 assists per game. The Hornets had made a couple moves to bolster their defense by rolling out a new backcourt of David Wesley and Bobby Phils going into 98. Mason had another solid season, but would drop to third on the team in scoring. However, he would still lead the team in rebounding while finishing second in assists, as he would have 32 double-doubles this season and would shoot over 50% for the fourth consecutive year. The Hornets turned in their second straight 50-win season, going 51-31, and which got them a first-round matchup with Atlanta in what would be one of the greatest postseason performances of Mason's career. The Hornets would win in four games, with Mason scoring a game-high 25 on 10 of 13 shooting in Game 2, and then a postseason career-high 29 with 14 rebounds on 13 of 18 shooting in Game 4. Round 2 brought the defending champion Bulls, who would defeat Charlotte in five games. Mason cooled down, but would again be the team's second leading scorer on 51% shooting. Jordan put up nearly 30 a game, but Mason did his best to make him work for it, as after shooting nearly 53% in Round 1, Jordan's shooting dropped to below 47% in their series versus Charlotte. But the regular season would see Mason average about 13 points, 10 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. The lockout season would be short for everyone, but it didn't happen for Mason, as during an early February practice, he would tear his bicep, which would keep him out for the entire year. Without him, the Hornets would go 26-24 and, and miss the playoffs. But this season would see them lose Devots to free agency, but sign Derek Coleman, and make another big move on March 10th, when they sent a package headlined by Glenn Rice to Los Angeles, for Eddie Jones and Eldon Campbell. Mason was back for 2000 and would play in all 82 games, as the Hornets would roll out a top 10 defense. Sadly, they would lose one of their top defenders on January 12th, after a street racing accident led to Bobby Phils losing his life. Mason would finish second on the team in rebounding and assists, while putting up 22 double-doubles and 3 triple-doubles. Additionally, he would put up a career-high 31 points to go along with 14 rebounds and 11 assists in a March 31st win versus Toronto. The Hornets spent most of the year trying to stay alive in the playoff chase, as after 66 games, they were 35-31. and 31. But they would then win 14 of their last 16 to finish at 49-33 and 33 and enter the playoffs with a first-round matchup versus Philly. Mason played well, averaging around 13-10-6, and 6, but the Hornets still lost in four games. And for the regular season, Mason averaged about 11.5 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game. But he would have a new home with a familiar face going into 2001. Mason and Jones had been traded to the Miami Heat during the offseason, who were still coached by Pat Riley. So it was unclear how this reunion would go. A 34-year-old Mason would join a Heat team on the tail end of their first great era of basketball, led by the duo of Alonzo Mourning and Tim Hardaway. But this duo wouldn't see the court together too often this year, as prior to the season, Mourning had been diagnosed with a serious kidney disease that was expected to end his year. However, he would return for the final 13 games of the year. Mason was brought in to come off the bench, but the loss of Mourning forced him into the starting lineup, where he had a resurgent year. He would finish second on the team in scoring, first in rebounds, and third in assists, as he would record 36 double-doubles this year. And he would have a 97.5 defensive rating, which placed him 16th in the league as one of three Heat players in the top 20 and he would also make his first and only all-star appearance, as a replacement for the injured Grant Hill. The Heat would have a top 5 defense, which propelled them to a surprising 50-win season, as they entered the playoffs with a matchup against Charlotte. Unfortunately, this series would end in an embarrassing sweep of the Heat, with the average margin of victory being over 22 points. Mason really struggled, averaging about 5 points and 3 rebounds on less than 39% shooting, and for the regular season, he would average about 16 points, 9.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Mason was waived during the offseason and would sign with the Bucks, who were coming off an Eastern Conference Finals appearance and led by the trio of Glenn Robinson, Ray Allen, and Sam Cassell. But this would be a very dysfunctional season in Milwaukee. Mason would play and start in all 82 games, but saw a dip in his usage, as he averaged less than 10 points per game for the first time since coming off the bench in 95. And he was not happy about this, as he felt that the Bucks couldn't be a successful team if they didn't commit to establishing an inside game which would eventually lead to Mason deliberately ignoring head coach George Carl, according to Ray Allen. The Bucks would finish the year at 41-41, and 41, which wouldn't get them into the playoffs. And for the regular season, Mason would average about 9.5 points, 8 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. The Bucks looked different going into 03, as they had traded away Glenn Robinson in the offseason, and then on February 20th, 
with the Bucks sitting at 27 and 26, they would trade Ray Allen to the Sonics for Gary Payton. Milwaukee would go 15 and 14 the rest of the way to finish at 42 and 40 and squeak into the playoffs. But the playoffs began with a first round matchup with the New Jersey Nets, who the Bucks would push to six games before losing. Mason was a non-factor in this series as his usage under Carl continued to diminish. He took just 20 shots over the six games and had one game with more than four points as he had been relegated to a bench roll. But his regular season would see him average about seven points, six and a half rebounds, and three assists per game. The Bucks would then release Mason after the season and he would retire shortly after, before passing away in 2015. And Anthony Mason would end a 13 year career, which saw him take a very unlikely route to the NBA. But he never gave up on himself and eventually became one of the most versatile and valued players in the league. An elite defensive player with the talent to do a bit of everything on the offensive end. He was one of many players that personified the Knicks hard nosed defensive style of play throughout the 90s and then finally showed his all-around ability when he got his chance in Charlotte. He was never going to be mentioned in the same breath as the stars of his era, but his overall impact on the game was arguably just as big as theirs. He unfortunately was dealt the label of having attitude problems and being a difficult player, but as his high school teammate once said, this was more so due to his immense confidence in himself and his ability. He did all the dirty work, which isn't what makes the headlines, but that's what puts teams over the edge and takes them to the playoffs and he wasn't afraid of anything or anyone. So backing down from a challenge was the last thing Anthony Mason was gonna do. But that's it for today's episode on Anthony Mason. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his Charlotte teammates or this one on another teammate from his Hornet and Heat days. Thanks for watching and see you next time.